All right, so let's get started with some case reports. And this is the highlight of what I want to tell you about before. So your, your revenge on an HMO director. There we go. So we have an HMO director who is Mike, who is 49 years old. Uh, irritable bowel syndrome um, his entire life, full workup included a colonoscopy, even though a little bit younger than the usual standard age. Um, symptoms have been worse over the past three months. No alarm symptoms. So who can tell me what the alarm symptoms are? Let's just do that little review. Rectal bleeding, yes. Anemia. Um, it can be fever, yes. Weight loss, who said that? I heard that. Uh, weight loss, um, fever, anemia, weight loss, rectal bleeding, and we also put together, here's your little ducky. Um, we uh, put together a couple of other things. If there is a family history of colon cancer, and if there is a family history of inflammatory bowel disease, that may lead us further in that um, direction to be um, more aggressive with these, uh, with these folks. Has tried. Antispasmodics, glutamine, lamotil, and tells you nothing works anymore. So, what would you would you recommend more tests? I'll accept just about any answer because we need to have this interaction. More tests, yes or no? Go ahead. Did you say he had a colonoscopy? Yes, he had had a colonoscopy. And um, here, here is the information. And it colonoscopy, um, irritable bowel, workup it included the colonoscopy, let's say, five years ago. OK, so we have a vote for repeating colonoscopy. Um, anybody else would be repeating a colonoscopy under these circumstances? No. Any other testing? SED rate, CRP? How do you know he has IBS? Oh, this is a um, workup that has been done in years gone by. We talked about that yesterday. How do we make a diagnosis of irritable bowel? So let me, let me put that back. So how do we make that diagnosis? I have no idea. Oh, here we go. We have the helpline. So tell me, the rest of you, how do we make that diagnosis of irritable bowel if we don't have alarm symptoms? How do we do that? It's a diagnosis of exclusion. Does that mean we have to do a lot of tests? We already did it. We've done, done, we've done some testing. Um, I didn't specify exactly what kind of testing. Um, so let's just do a little bit of a, um, of a review here, because that we need to uh, get back down to. So uh, can anybody tell me the uh, kind of appropriate testing um, if there are no alarm symptoms under these circumstances? TGA. Um, a TG, um, you're talking about TTG. TTG IGA. TTG IGA, which is for our, our friend in the back, which is checking for? Sprue, uh, celiac disease. That's a reasonable one. CRP. I think that's a, that's a pretty reasonable one. What else would, um, would you folks be thinking about? Can you get a better history? You can get better history. Maybe there's, some, maybe there's something else going on uh, over there. I agree with you. I mean, what does he mean by worse over the past? He's lived with this his whole life. Yeah, but again, when we have these irritable bowel patients, what happens usually is they say it's worse than it's ever been before. And again, um, I agree with you wholeheartedly. Maybe there's something going on in his family. We talked about that yesterday. Um, maybe there's a divorce situation, a financial reverse, kids going bad, a gazillion things. And again, that's, that's part of what we need to, to find out about. I agree with you. But let's just get back to the workup. Let's assume that there's been nothing significant with uh, what's going on in the uh, family. And let's assume that we're just, um, you know, want to do a little bit of a basic workup. So CBC, we would also um, think about under these circumstances. Uh, TTG, thyroid, things along those lines. We know, um, and just reviewing yesterday, um, we know this actually looks good with your blueberries there. Um, we know yesterday, uh, we had talked about this before, that, um, that the uh, probability of any of these testing, uh, all, any of this testing being positive is very low. 
That is not to discourage you from doing testing, but it is to say that, uh, again, we, we have a low probability of um, you know, picking up any of these, uh, any of these things. Um, and again, part of what we talked about yesterday is without alarm symptoms, a colonoscopy would be very low yield. And it's not to talk you out of doing colonoscopies on these people, but it's just to say what the probability of a yield would be uh, that gives us information that's useful. So um, we've tried antispasmodics. We've tried glutamine. We've tried Lomotil. Nothing works anymore. What would you recommend for more tests? Anything more in terms of testing that we would think about? You could ask someone who had recently antibiotics. Perfect. This is the whole point. Because again, um, when I create these kind of cases, it's not to just say, you know, it's all, you know, um, in one direction. So exactly right that you want to see if they're antibiotics because you're worried about? C. Diff. C. Diff. And C. Diff can happen how many weeks after antibiotics? It can be months. It can be months. It's usually a, a few weeks, but it can be months. That can be part of this difficulty as well. Any other thoughts before we move on to medications? What exactly are his symptoms? What are his symptoms? Abdominal pain, bloating, and um, let's say, let's go back to it. Um, irritable bowel with diarrhea, abdominal pain, bloating, and diarrhea. Um, so that's um, what we're talking about. Glutamine, everybody remember yesterday what we talked about glutamine. It's an amino acid. It is basically one of these um, nonspecific, um, uh, almost homeopathic uh, types of medicines that does have a beneficial effect with regard to uh, diarrhea, and especially for those people who don't want to go on to heavy-duty medicines. So talking about heavy-duty medicines, what other medicines can we think about? We talked about a huge list yesterday. And this case is designed to review those medicines with you. What else can we think about? Um, we can think about Zyfaxin. So tell me about Zyfaxin. What's Zyfaxin for the rest of the audience? It's an, it's an antibiotic. Uh, rifaximin uh, um, and, um, is basically a, um, an antibiotic that is used um, and is uh, currently um, um, approved for small bowel overgrowth, irritable bowel syndrome, and um, its dosage is 550, three times a day, three times a day for two weeks. You already know. Um, and is it a cheap drug or is it an expensive drug? Expensive. It's an expensive drug. So if we get into this kind of process with our patients, after you get the coupon, and again, we're reviewing yes, uh, what we talked about in these past couple of days, when you get the coupon and the patient gets the first dosage basically for free, and they come to you six months later and they're having the same symptoms and they have to pay $500, uh, you're going to be caught in a squeeze, especially if they don't have that uh, upward mobility of being able to pay for it. So it may work. So that's one. What else can we think about? What's cheap? We talked about the cheap medicines. Probiotics. Here's your rubber ducky, probiotics. Are it, it, is uh, one probiotic better than the other? We, we talked about that also yesterday. There have been no side-to-side -side comparisons among the probiotics. And if a person wants to take something along the lines of a uh, yogurt, how much yogurt would they need to take? A lot. So you got that? So here you go, get ready to catch. So um, that's exactly right. So they would have to take a lot of yogurt to be able to accom uh, accommodate all of the probiotic in their system. And um, somebody, the first, among the first answers yesterday, I think you had the first answers yesterday, something long-term, cheap as uh, dirt and used for depression as well, is? You know, it can be any, any of that uh, category. Um, the category, what's that? Plus he's a uh, HMO director, he needs it. Um, we need it because we deal with him, uh, <laughs> right. Um, he gets the, he probably gets the, he probably gets the pleasure out of that, but we get the aggravation, right? Um, so yeah, maybe a, um, uh, an antidepressant. So rather than, let's say, an SNRI, SSRI, 
because any of these any of these categories in the literature there's different um, there's different parts of the literature that have different effectiveness uh, for each one of these. But I always go with the cheapest category possible, um, something uh, something as simple as an amitriptyline for these kind of people. And again, how long will it take for the amitriptyline to start to get a serum level? Short or long? Yeah, it's going to take a few weeks, right? So uh, we got to figure out something in the meantime while he's still uh, sick. So um, you know, we may have to go to another antispasmodic. So let's let's talk about uh, a few of these things. Yes, sir. Um, when you ask about probiotics, I, what I like is a line, but these are individually packaged. Once you open the bottle, these are vacuum packed, and they need to be kept in the fridge. A lot of patients don't do that. So the probiotics, I don't know how long they last at room temperature, but they, they deteriorate. Okay. So, so the comment is uh, probiotics deteriorate. The one that you're thinking about that uh, needs to be refrigerated, there, there's a, there are two components to it is the VSL. There's a VSL, which is one of the other uh, probiotics uh, that need to be refrigerated. Uh, but again, there's, no, there's not a tremendous amount of science that we have yet. We know that Align is, is certainly advertised very well, or Bifantis. Um, we know that um, uh, the, there is a significant amount of literature. But um, again, one of the other tricks that we have when we're having a patient of this nature is that if one probiotic loses effectiveness or doesn't work, we can always go with the next one. So there's always that possibility. So um, peppermint, we talked about peppermint yesterday. Who can tell me about Iberagast? We mentioned that also uh, um, actually two days ago. Who can tell me about Iberagast? Remember about all of that? It's the Amazon product that's an herbal medicine. And um, it's an herbal medicine. It's available about 36 bucks. And again, it's particularly useful for those uh, patients who just don't want to take um, prescription medications. And um, it is 20 drops uh, three or four times a day. And let's talk about medical food. Anybody remember about Enterogam? Enterogram um, is um, one of the medicines that is available by prescription. It's a bovine immunoglobulin. It was developed, uh, originally developed for cow disease uh, to uh, uh, prevent their uh, diarrhea from uh, persisting. But it's also useful for uh, irritable bowel with diarrhea, among other diseases. You can look it up. Unfortunately, it's also expensive. So that's part of the dilemma right now in primary care is to be cost effective uh, under these circumstances. Anybody's used cholestyramine for chronic diarrhea? Yeah, so tell me about it. So let me say that you, you've, you've had a chance to speak. So tell me about cholestyramine and chronic, chronic diarrhea. I suggest that, I definitely suggest Metabucil, at least a two week trial of that, and I find that it helps a number of patients too. But I tell them it normalizes your stool. If it's runny, it makes it firm. If it's too hard, it makes it soft. Okay, so here's the eyeball. Um, so uh, who, else, who else uses Metamucil? I think most of you are going to be raising your hand. Metamucil is interesting, and I want to tell you a little bit about Metamucil um, because there's been a co anybody familiar with a, what Cochrane analysis is? It's this huge meta-analysis, um, non uh, non-proprietary meta-analysis that is starting to put doubt into fiber. I still use it. I still recommend that uh, that you use it. Um, my only suggestion: Does everybody agree with Metamucil? What's that? Yeah, so a different kind of fiber. What's been the problem with Metamucil? Gas, right. So uh, there are other products there as well. And you may actually have success with using one of the other kinds of fiber. You have to, you have to see with your individual patient. If they do well with Metamucil, God bless them. And you're, you're going to be a happy, happy camper. But if they don't do well with Metamucil, you move on to one of the other fibers before you even think about these other things. So, so that's great. So those are the enterogram that you What's a dose? It's a, it comes as a formulation, and I, I recommend that you look at the, um, at the uh, website because it's all changed. And it's basically uh, one or two doses uh, a day, depending upon the diarrhea. If the diarrhea is more severe, it even goes up, up to three or four doses a day. Remember, it's incredibly expensive, so we want to be cost effective. Um, it may be a last-ditch effort if, um, um, 
I wouldn't even think about it as a last ditch effort. I would think about it as uh, for a person who wouldn't want to go on the, on the antidepressant category for whatever reason. They have a hang up about antidepressants. Aunt Tilly was in antidepressants, then they sent her to a home. Um, I'm not going to be on antidepressants. So a person who has resistance to antidepressants, because antidepressants are, ch are fairly cheap, especially uh, amitriptyline. So um, I, it's a food supplement, like I mean, a medical food. Yes, it's a medical food, and you and you prescribe it. Um, it's a prescription item. So um, when you are back home, just look it up, and you'll see. But again, remember, it's expensive, so that creates creates additional and difficulty. You know, I re recommend uh, essence of peppermint, um, and again, that's what some pharmacies have. You will, might end up with oil of peppermint. Oil and water don't mix very well, and peppermint, remember, um, when you do peppermint, um, it's going to be 10 drops with a glass of water three or four times a day. 10 drops three or four times a day. So if they give you oil of peppermint, they may have to chug a lug the, the 10 drops and then follow it by water. It's cheap as dirt. It's about five bucks to 10 bucks for a bottle. And, and, and um, the pharmacist may not even have that available and they have to order it in from their supplier. But that's part of the deal with, with these irritable bowel. Why use these expensive medicines if we can have success with the cheaper ones, right? Um, it comes, it, essence of peppermint is a wonderful suspension form, but it has the alcohol. Not, a, not every pharmacy can get a hold of it. Um, oil, uh, peppermint oil, most, most pharmacies can get a hold of much easier. So, um, so we, we talked about cholestyramine. Is there any problem in using cholestyramine? What's the problem with using cholestyramine if you're on other medications? It binds the other medicines. That's exactly right. So um, again, if you have a patient on uh, the average um, American now is on several medicines a day, maybe eight or ten medicines a day that we're seeing. And if you have them on cholestyramine, the usual way of uh, having them take the uh, other medicines, avoid the medicine one hour before and two hours afterwards. They're going to be up 24 hours a day trying to figure out when they can squeeze the medicines in. So, but if you have a patient who's on few medicines, um, there we go. Uh, antidepressant category, uh, we talked about that. Uh, use the side effects to your advantage. Uh, keep it as simple as possible and as, as inexpensive as possible. Empiric pancreatic enzymes, um, does everybody remember why we talked about that the other day? What are we worried about with, um, when I'm giving empiric pancreatic enzymes? Pancreatic insufficiency, that's exactly right. So again, um, that's my particular approach. Um, again, the reason, the reason that I do that is uh, the, the point is that um, some of these people do indeed have pancreatic insufficiency. Um, and doing a big workup sometimes uh, adds to the cost and doesn't uh, give a tremendous amount of benefit. So pancreatic enzymes, we talked about probiotics. We talked about uh, gluten-free diet and FODMAP diet. And uh, because you answered that question, I need you to tell everybody nice and loud. It's very early in the morning. And what does this say? Gastroenterology requires guts. Gastroenterology requires guts. That's exactly right. So let's move on. Rita is an 82-year-old female who wants a screening colonoscopy. She's healthy. Here's her medicine. She's not on very much. No family history of colon cancer. And what would you advise? Talk her out of it. Talk her out of it. What's that? I'm from Florida. They all get them. They all get them, right? OK, so we have two varying opinions. So let's do the vote, because I'm, I'm really interested to see. So Rita, who is pretty healthy, um, and then I'm going to give you some interesting background information. 82 years old, pretty healthy. I mean, if she had three heart attacks, two strokes, um, has another underlying um, uh, major illness like a cancer, we don't have that clear answer. Healthy, but she wants um, a screening colonoscopy at age 82. How many of you would vote for a colonoscopy for Rita? Let me see those hands. How many would vote for no colonoscopy? Okay, so let me see. So that's the majority of you would vote for no colonoscopy. Yes. 
Has she had a screening colonoscopy before? Excellent question. Never has had one. Okay. If she had had one, that would be much easier to be able to talk her out. Now to have one because she's all of a sudden eighty-two. Because she just decided. You know, she read it. She read about um, colon cancer um, in um, you know one of the magazines, a AARP magazine, uh, which I get, and uh, said, you know, can't can't let a uh, process like that uh, be lingering. Uh, you need to be aggressive. So what are the other alternatives? Um, so uh, many of you had said no colonoscopy. Would you do any sort of testing? A fit test. OK, so that's great. So uh, who said fit test? Because I need you to talk further. So tell everybody about that fit test. Well, it would be the fecal immuno uh, testing. Fecal immuno, immuno, immunohistochemical testing. And it is a fairly good uh, screening method. Um, and with uh, sensitivity and specificity around the 70s uh, range, which is fine. Um, anybody want to tell me one other test? Because we talked about that two days ago. Cola guard. OK. And what's happening with that? Is it higher, higher um, uh, specificity, sensitivity? What's going on with that one? It's higher in terms of. Um, uh, of um, uh, sensitivity, uh, specificity is not as high because there are going to be a lot of false positives. So it's going to pick up a lot more false positives. But again, whichever route you choose, uh, realize, first of all, uh, Cologuard is appropriate for the um, Medicare population. I'm not aware that uh, Cologuard is still uh, is yet approved uh, by HMOs. Um, so it's in the Medicare population. So a FIT test is an appropriate way. A Cologar test is an appropriate way uh, of approaching this. And um, you know, for those who want to uh, think about colonoscopy, let me tell you a little bit background. And this always leads, as you can see from the last few days, this always leads to further discussion. I can tell you that when um, the original guidelines were first developed many years ago, um, uh, the guidelines had originally said, stop colonoscopy screening at age 70, which is only a few years away from me. I would want to have that potential for colonoscopy. Every society has different guidelines. Every society has different guidelines. And if you're going by one of uh, the guidelines from one of our GI societies, which is uh, obviously applicable in Florida, uh, I'm going to tell you what the GI societies have, uh, have said. But again, it's just for informational purposes. So the GI societies have said that if you have a healthy gentleman, um, you can continue um, doing screening colonoscopies. And healthy, you see what we're talking about with Rita on the female side, um, healthy up to 82, in females up to 84. But again, this is the guidelines. And tell me what's happening in Florida. Just about everybody's getting colonoscopy. If they're You, you said what I need to say, is if their life expectancy is more than five years, um, then we can consider that. And my point here is not to be aggressive with colonoscopy, but it's an opportunity out there. Because again, it's the best of the tests out there to make a diagnosis. There are false positives and false negatives with both FIT and um, with uh, Cologuard. But it's out there. It's out there as an alternative, uh, a way of approaching uh, this particular patient. Let's move on. Would this change if Rita told you that her son was just diagnosed with colon cancer? I heard a no. I heard a yes. Yes. Why is that? It's uh, inheritance plays a part. Yes. 50% hers. Yes. So. Uh, inheritance plays a part. We usually think about it, and it's a, it's a paradigm shift for all of us. We usually think about it parent to kid, but again, we're doing so many colonoscopies these days, we can always have it the other way around, uh, child to adult. So that, that would influence me in particular uh, uh, much more strongly to think about being aggressive under these circumstances. That's exactly right. Does it make a difference the age of the No. No, not, not this way around. It would make an age difference, and that's a wonderful question, um, because 
uh, when we're talking about, um, and I'm glad that you brought this up because you helped remind me about an, another topic that I want to tell everybody about, is if you have the colon cancer and you're looking in the usual fashion, parent to child, and parent at age 85 had a colon cancer and child is a different circumstance than parent had colon cancer at age 50 and a child needs to be much more aggressively pursued. So we're talking about different, uh, different cancers and there may even be um, very significant um, non-hereditary non uh, polyposis uh, syndromes going on that may be important and the younger ones, when you have a younger family member um, who had had colon cancer, absolutely important to be very aggressive with the next generation, much more aggressive than, than if it's at an older age. So, Peter, real quickly, so um, a 92-year-old physician comes in with his cancer, his son, who's a cancer physician, both very well known in your community, and asks you to, to uh, do a colon, colonoscopy on his dad, who had one um, 10 years ago and was fine. He's had a history of abdominal surgery in the interim for benign abdominal pain they're insistent, 92. Direct. So the gastroenterologist reluctantly does it. And, and it turns out to be a very difficult procedure with a floppy colon, uh, a very tight area around where the surgery had been done, um, and, it's, uh, and everything comes out fine. The only problem is he has a 1.5 centimeter polyp. Now you're faced with having to redo it. Correct. So my son's a gastroenterologist. He tells me some of these stories. Correct. Well, tell your son this because again, we've had these we've had these kinds of conversations. And again, at that young stage, I used to do that as well. At a later stage in life, I absolutely refused because I said it's not worth it. Because your son is going to be faced with this kind of thing. That same patient, God forbid, has a, has a perforation and the patient dies. You don't want to deal with it. I remember that. And in the beginning, and I'm going to tell you something very personal. In the beginning, as a gastroenterologist, you want to have a great reputation in the community. You want to be the yes guy who does stuff that everybody else doesn't do. But ultimately, the answer is, and I've had this happen to me, and that's why I changed my approach, is to be as conservative as possible. Let somebody else be the cowboy. That's, that's the answer. I'm just bringing this up because when we, as primary care docs, ask you, the gastroenterologist, to do this service, and you say you don't feel comfortable doing it, that's the answer to the patient. <laughs> no, that's not the answer to the patient in my area. They just go to the next hospital and the next doctor because uh, that's, that's, that's what they, that's, that's what they, yeah, that's what they do. And it's happened to me. I, ref, I had one of these, exactly the same thing. I pray to the Lord every day and I say, thank you, Lord, because exactly the same thing happened. The other, the other gastroenterologist who was absolutely superb did that colonoscopy, had a perforation, uh, that patient did very, very, it survived, but did very poorly. So you have to, as, as a gastroenterologist, you just have to take a stand and just say, I'm not going to do it. It's not worth it. <coughs> Barry Menema, I really don't recommend these days because, again, um, let's, let's go to the helpline here. What is the chance of a barium enema picking up any sort of lesion in the colon? What's the percentage that everybody thinks? Give me some numbers. 30, 40, 50, up to 50 percent. So, you know, you can pick up a big gazumba. Remember the big gazumbas that we used to see when we were young? Those big gazumbas, we'll see them every time, but the polyps and the rest of that, you know, we can miss a significant number. That's why there have been so many of these other alternatives. The FIT test, um, the Cologuard, virtual colonoscopy, and we have virtual col colonoscopy right now. The trouble, virtual colonoscopy, virtual MRI, the trouble is that as a screening method, the federal government in its wisdom has decided not to pay for it for the patients who need it the most. Um, and, um, you know, under urgent situations, we can probably get it done, but uh, as a screening method, we can't. So that's a big, big problem. If you're going to at all do a barium enema, it's going to be an air contrast barium enema with a person around our age who really knows what they're doing. Right? Not the young ones who don't care and want to do the MRIs. Did, uh, did you say what age? 
like if you have a parent who's in the 50s or 60s that had colon cancer at what age you advise? Oh, at, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be very happy to tell you those, those statistics. So if you have a young proband like that, it has to be 15 to 20 years younger than that, than that age. That's when they need to have that, colon that first colonoscopy. So you're talking about 30s. You're absolutely talking about 30s. In Connecticut, I've never had pushbacks with regard to that. Um, you would have to check with your state. But again, the more important thing is doing the right thing medically. Absolutely, 15 to 20 percent, that's pretty standard. So let's talk about this. This is a, um, another real life situation. Uh, the name has been changed to protect the innocent. This gentleman came to see me. Uh, this is obviously not the, the uh, exact gentleman, but it is the exact scenario, who came to see me at a conference down south, um, oh, I would say within the past year. 37-year-old emergency room attending with a history of intermittent rectal bleeding. He had a fellow ER doctor do a sigmoidoscopy and found bleeding hemorrhoids. Harry asked me, should I have a colonoscopy? How do we answer? Um, no family history. That's always a great question. Smoker. Ooh, I love that. Why are you asking about smoking? It's a risk factor, right? It was um, actually developed um, by uh, that theory was put together, and I have to mention his name because he's a uh, colleague from uh, UConn who's moved on to other places. Dr. Anderson had made that uh, distinction and given us that information years ago. So smoking is a uh, important risk factor. There is no smoking for him. Alcohol, there's no significant alcohol for him. Another risk factor, perfect. Yeah, sorry about, sorry about the risk factors. It's just gonna be a straightforward yes or no. No, oh, I see a lot of people, no. Do I have any hands for yes? Yes, a lot of hands for yes. Why, why is that? Um, I didn't say family history at all. No history. Yeah. So why why do you want to do why do you want to be aggressive and pursue this with a colonoscopy? Because the sigmoidoscopy, of course, is only going to only going to evaluate the sigmoid, uh, the distal part of the colon. So it could be a polyp for some lesion in the, and it could be something other than cancer. You know, it could be you know an, uh, it could be um, an AB, you know, AB malformation. It could be a polyp. It could be anything. So anyway, you want to check. The you want to check the whole colon. And again, I'm going to be the devil's advocate. And I'm going to ask you something. Um, uh, but, but my colleague just saw blood coming directly from that hemorrhoid. Why should I waste my time? You have an answer for that? I do. He's a fellow ER doctor did the sigmoid osteoporosis. That's right. I had a gynecologist <clears throat> who uh, told the patient she had hemorrhoids and she had an amelanotic melanoma of the, uh, the rectal sigmoid area, the rectal area. Right. So, so the, the message here is as follows. It's not that the emergency room uh, colleague made the uh, wrong diagnosis, probably made the right diagnosis. Can there be something coincidentally there at the right side of the colon that was not detected by just that sigmoidoscopy? The answer for me is very, very clear. You don't take chances. You don't take chances with this kind of thing. Go ahead. But you weren't doing this as a colon cancer screening test. You were doing this to look for a cause of rectal bleeding. You were the right side of the lesion cause rectal bleeding. It is a coincidental right. element. So you're absolutely right. Can the can the right side of the lesion cause um, can cause um, uh, rectal bleeding? Not unless it's massive, but we've met that criteria of alarm symptoms. Remember the alarm symptoms? It's rectal bleeding. So we got rectal bleeding. That's enough of a reason. And the other reason is, across the country, when I've done this lecture, there are lots of folks out there who are saying, you're a young patient. The chances of you having colon cancer are very low. And here's what I want to teach you today. Look at this stuff. It's unbelievable. The thing is, and again, I, let me tell you the story because I think this will, will, um, will uh, hit home for all of you is um, when I have done colonoscopies in the past, um, you know, we do a lot of elderly people. Occasionally we have young people in there and I can never even um, uh, tell you how I feel when I have a 43 year old gentleman having a screen, a, not even a screen colonoscopy, colonoscopy for the rectal bleeding 
we find a big cancer in the colon. He's in the recovery room crying. His wife is in the recovery room crying, and his three kids are in the recovery room crying. This is a message that I want to share with you. You have to ultimately make your own decisions, but that is the message that I want to share with all of you. And look at these statistics. The overall incidence of colorectal cancer has been decreasing since 1998 for those over 50. One of the most important things I can share with you as well, I wish we as gastroenterologists could take credit for this entire thing. Certainly colonoscopy has had a significant impact with reducing colorectal cancers. There's another element besides this. 15% of colon cancers are now detected below age 50. What's the screening age? It is? 50, and in the black population, it is 45. That's exactly right. So we can't deny these other people the potential for getting that evaluation done. So over here, number three, there's been an increase in colon cancer for those under 49. Colon cancer in young adults is often much more aggressive. So again, I want you to think about that, and we, with that, we can move on to the next case, why is it so important for me to remember that cows say moo? Margaret, 85-year-old, who sees you for rectal bleeding. Look at what's going on with Margaret. Uh, Margaret is in the middle there. Um, 85 years old, ejection fraction of, eight, of 28. Here are her medicines. She's an ill-appearing uh, female. There are her vital signs, some rels. Hitting edema, H&H, &H, 20.5. Okay, you guys see this stuff all the time. Now what are you going to do with Dr. Buck in the room? What are you going to tell me? Blood transfusion, stabilization, and? Tune-up, and? Oh, you made me very happy. You shook your head. You don't, want, you don't want us to even go near this patient, right? Right. Wonderful. Okay. Sometimes when I do this, um, when I do this, um, I hear, you know, transfuse and then start to do aggressive procedures. But you guys know in this room that blood is a wonderful approach to these kind of patients. And we know that under the majority, and I, lo I love that, that smile because you know what I'm talking about. We transfuse these people. Most of them we're going to be fine with, right? And the only ones that I get into trouble with and I've gotten into trouble with are those who have this persistently happening. So you know, they have the anemia, and then about two or three weeks later, they have anemia. And that's, that's really a GI problem. That's when you have to really work with your gastroenterologist. And what I do is, uh, if, I, if I'm faced with that, I can uh, tell them something along the lines is, I'm not thrilled about doing procedures. If you want me to do this as a last ditch effort where mama can potentially die on the table, uh, these are the words that I use. Um, understand that that can happen, but even if we find a cancer, what the hell are we going to do with this, right? So I kind of lead them down the path, and that's the other message that I want to share with you. If you give the kind of message that, um, you know, I don't think there's very much more to do, as opposed to um, your gastroenterologist is going to see you and, and fix this up, you're going to make it much easier all the way through. Uh, we're going to be re-emphasizing what you guys have already said, and which is to say, I don't think there's very much more to do, as opposed to try to talk them out of it um, and just, you know, they have these high expectations. We're going to make mama uh, 65 years old again. She's going to be perfect, and uh, there'll never be a problem again. So I compliment all of you for saying be conservative under these circumstances. Yes, sir? Is it is she not more likely to have angiodysplasia just when you have, I mean, um, there, there could be There could be angiodysplasia. It, har it hardly... Yeah, it hardly matters. Yeah, and just and just then you can coagulate. You can co recurring bleed and recurring transfusion. Right. So um, so let's let's talk a little bit about that. So the question was, can angiodysplasias be part of this as well? From my perspective, it hardly matters, and here's the reason. And you're absolutely right. Um, can angiodysplasias uh, be a source of all of this? But we're dealing with a, a very high risk uh, patient. Putting a colonoscope in these high-risk uh, kind of people, even if I just clip those angiodysplasias. Years ago, we used to cauterize them, and they were potential for uh, perforations. But I can tell you, over the years, 
having seen these kind of patients, there is a potential for some of them to end up in the emergency room before I even start with them because they can't even tolerate their PrEP. The PrEPs are very vigorous. I've had a, a number of these people coming in when I was young, a young pup, um, and you know, ST wave changes, chest pains, all kinds of things, hypotension, um, all kinds of things happening. I wouldn't want to start with them. Um, and again, unless I'm, my back is against the wall, um, I would absolutely um, not want to address these kind of things because however we address this, it's not going to turn out too well. The chances of it turning out well are very, very low. Let's go on to Emma, which is a slightly different kind of uh, situation. And again, uh, let's, let's see what we can come up with, uh, with Emma here. And Emma is a 34-year-old uh, patient with a two-year history of foul-smelling loose uh, bowel movements, autoimmune uh, thyroiditis, headaches, fatigue, depression, body aches. Here's uh, what's happening in the lab. She's obviously iron deficient. Um, TSH, um, CRP, chem, uh, colonoscopy, and biopsy, all negative. Why did we do biopsies? Microscopic colitis, excellent. And any further workup? Let me go back so you can recheck me because there's something missing. TTG, TTG, wonderful. And um, so what we're talking about uh, when, we're, when we're talking about TTG, obviously we're looking along the lines of uh, SPRU, but again, make sure that you do that TTG as part of that workup. And here is a uh, little bit more information for those of you um, who need uh, further convincing because it does run in families. So if, um, uh, if you doubted it in the beginning, if her first cousin had SPRU, it does run in families. So here's another one of these situations. So I'm glad that we're, we're talking about the, you know, the risk situation with, uh, with colonoscopy because Sam is a wonderful example. Sam, 89 years old with diarrhea, 10 pound weight loss in two months, physical examination unremarkable, obviously anemia, sigmoidoscope could only reach the sigmoid. Look at this. Where's the lumen? I can't tell. Somewhere's in there. Um, and Obviously, what do we think about in the differential? Nice and loud. Come on, don't be scared. I heard it. Cancer, right? And what's the other part of the differential? Not necessarily colitis. What do we see here? What is the pic? Diverticulosis. Diverticulosis. Um, if you had a long-standing history of many episodes of diverticulitis infection, you can get a colon that is narrowed. And there's several messages that I want to share with you. So again, um, look at that. If there are uh, several episodes, the, the uh, lumen, gets, uh, lumen gets narrowed. And um, so, so the test that we uh, can consider next is, even before I get to that, let me always make sure that you are checking on those reports. Because a um, gastroenterologist or surgeon couldn't get around, um, doesn't mean that there's nothing going on. So you need to make sure that there's some follow-up. A um, MR enterography, a CAT scan enterography, a CAT scan, um, some, some sort of follow-up needs to be happening because, again, otherwise it, pre it presents itself with a potential liability. You've already started to go halfway in there and get some of the information. And uh, occasionally we see in these kinds of situations that they turn out to be um, bad news, and we don't we don't want that. Um, you would have to check with your situation. My my preference, again, if your institution will allow it and will be reimbursed for it, is a uh, uh, MR enterography or a CAT M enterography. But make sure in your practice that these people, if they've had this kind of thing happening, um, that there's a follow up. And again. My last choice among things would be an air contrast barium enema. The usual story with these unfortunate folks is because they're elderly and debilitated, they can't hold on to that barium. And I've seen that report multiple times before. They've attempted, 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 can't hold on to it. Yes, ma'am. Why would you do a big workup on a man his age? It just, 
the, the point here is I wouldn't particularly do it, but occasionally it happens for, you know, in other institutions. I personally wouldn't do it, uh, but other people may. And again, the whole point is the teaching point is if this happens in your community and it's a halfway uh, process like this, you don't want to, um, you don't want to miss uh, something further going on. And it's a wonderful question. I wouldn't in particular do that. Okay, uh, Joan is a 19-year-old college student with diarrhea for one year. Now finals week. And my, uh, my office practice uh, was located um, 10 miles away from University of Connecticut with 35,000 students. So we uh, used to see this all the time. Um, and usually around finals time. 19-year-old uh, college student with diarrhea for one year. Now finals week and she reports 12 non-bloody bowel movements per day. No fever, weight loss, abdominal pain. She gave up smoking one month ago. Uses ibuprofen regularly for severe menstrual cramps. Physical examination unremarkable. Here's the labs. Um, and what I want to point out um, is um, this colonoscopy. The colonoscopy is basically um, showing um, some inflammation. Can somebody label what we're talking about over here? Ulcerative, it's going to be an ulcerative colitis. It's in this one in particular, it's an ulcerative proctitis. Um, so it is an inflammatory uh, process uh, going on in the colon. And there are a few questions that uh, I want to help solidify with you um, because, again, it'll talk to the point of uh, what we're dealing with these days with um, uh, ulcerative colitis. So here are the questions. Why is smoking important in this case? So ulcerative colitis um, in smoking, uh, it suppresses the disease. In Crohn's disease, what does it do? It does the opposite. Here is the message for all of you, because we as gastroenterologists are very, very busy in what we're doing, but we're not perfect. And sometimes we see people, and let's move a little bit uh, away from the ulcerative colitis to Crohn's disease. Let's talk about Crohn's disease. People with Crohn's disease who are now going back to their smoking. And we are piling on the medicines, the next medicine, and the next medicine, and the next medicine, which you know are extremely expensive, especially if they're anti-TNFs. And suddenly they're going back to the smoking. We may have been too busy to ask that. We may have not heard and listened. You guys are going to be seeing them a lot more often. If they are going back to their smoking with Crohn's disease, you need to get them off their smoking because all of that smoking will be almost the equal effect of uh, lots of the medicines that we give. So it's equal and opposite directions. You're going to be doing that patient a tremendous favor. Why is ibuprofen similarly important? And it's a great one for you guys. It's a, what's that? It does exacerbate, you're exactly right, in a different format, ibuprofen or non-steroidals exacerbate microscopic colitis. That's exactly right. But what does it do to ulcerative colitis? Do we have a difference of opinion? I have a question. Well, hold, hold on, because I want to make sure we got this teaching point. <laughs> ibuprofen does what to the stomach and the duodenum? Potentially, oh, ibuprofen or non-steroidals does what to the intestine it's in a very similar manner? Inflammation. Inflammation can make it worse. So the whole point here is when we think about non-steroidals, we as primary care folks are usually thinking about the upper tract. It can happen to the lower tract as well, and we're going to reemphasize that in just a moment with another case. Be aware of that. Be aware of that kind of thing where, uh, and again, we'll, we'll see the example. It'll, it'll be um, uh, very elucidating to you because, again, lots of things in our hands can make this uh, worse. What's your question, sir? Well, I was wondering why <coughs> she had non-bloody stools with all that. Because, because some of the patients, some patients just have that minimal kind of inflammation. Uh, obviously, you are aware of the ulcerative, or ulcerative colitis kind of situation. Some of them have profuse rectal bleeding or moderate rectal bleeding, but not all of them. Some of them just have diarrhea and maybe a drop of blood here and there, and they're not 
uh, it's not on their radar screen. So here's a couple of other things. Do we treat ulcerative colitis differently from pancolitis? Yes. Yes. Why? Locally, that's exactly right. Enemas, suppositories, and things like that. Why worry about systemic effects of all of these fancy medicines? I can tell you um, in 40 years of practice of gastroenterology, very rarely did I have to give systemic medicines for a product guidance. It happens very rarely, but you're exactly right. You treat it locally. You avoid the systemic effects of these medicines. Great. You guys are doing well. Can Jones ulcerative proctitis evolve into pancolitis? Yes, rarely. Rarely. What you, what you start with is usually what you end up with. So it can rarely change. You'll know that. You'll know that because, again, there'll be bleeding. There'll be anemia. There'll be uh, worsening anemia. There'll be all kinds of systemic things going on. But generally, what you start with is what you end up with. And occasionally, the disease burns out. Occasionally, the disease burns out. Uh, very rare, but it can occasionally happen. Yes, sir? Yes, the disease, the disease can burn out. So. Uh, you guys in this room, you've had hundreds of years of uh, clinical experience, and you may have seen a patient like that. The, year, the patients from, um, I remember the, the patients from when I first started practice in the, in the 80s, m I, I would imagine, and maybe we're talking about the same kind of patient, that many of these people might have had an infectious colitis going on, and then because we were not as sophisticated back then, we called it an ulcerative colitis, but again, the ultimate answer is the disease can burn itself out. Yes? Why did she get a colonoscopy? Um, that particular, um, you're, that's a wonderful question. That particular doctor just decided to be much more aggressive than, uh, than others, and that's exactly right. That reemphasizes the point that we talked about over these past few days. Um, again, as clinicians, you need to make that decision. I gave you some guidelines. But we know that guidelines are malleable based on your clinical circumstances. You will have gut feelings about these pe people, no pun intended, and you will say that you know, certain of them, despite negative alarm symptoms, you may want to be a lot more aggressive with. So again, this reemphasizes that point, and thank you very much for bringing that up. Um, what is the relationship of food and stress to ulcerative colitis? Is there a relationship? Yeah, there may be. There may be. So uh, the kind of diets that we talk about are uh, things that we talked about the other day with irritable bowel. Uh, we talk about fiber. We talk about uh, lactose. Uh, we talk about um, you know, uh, uh, diet foods and things like that. So there may be, there may be a relationship. Um, what are some extraintestinal manifestations of ulcerative colitis? What's that? I, I couldn't hear you. Joint. Okay, joint, skin, eyes, back, ankylosing spondylitis in particular. Can these extraintestinal manifestations occur before the diagnosis of ulcerative colitis? Absolutely. Be aware of that. Be aware of that as too. Can inflammatory bowel disease and irritable bowel syndrome coexist? Yes. That's the cutting edge. There have been a lot of these kind of questions, and you've had to answer yes to just about every one of them. And here's the cutting edge, and I want to just tell you about what's happening in gastroenterology um, these days, um, is that we have discovered that some of these people who, um, let me just talk about the ulcerative colitis, uh, can have ulcerative colitis for a lengthy period of time. We give heavy do doses of medicines, and they still have diarrhea. They still have diarrhea. We reinsert the scope, nothing to be seen. We do a CRP, normal. So they have a combination of ulcerative colitis and irritable bowel. And now, because the intestine is looking so clean, the CRP is normal. We continue with the therapy for ulcerative colitis because you don't want to take that away, but we treat them for irritable bowel. In years gone by, we all made the mistake they had, more, they had more troubles. We just cranked up the medicines, more steroids. And you know what happened with all of those, those steroids that we used to give? More anti-TNFs, switching anti-TNFs, and the rest of that. So the, the answer that I want to share with you is irritable bowel and inflammatory bowel disease can coexist. Before you, yes. Just to clarify, 
So you said smoking suppresses ulcerative colitis and aggravates Crohn's? That's exactly right. Uh, NSAIDs can aggravate both, but in particular, um, I want to talk about the uh, ulcerative colitis. It, it affects ulcerative colitis much more than Crohn's disease, but it certainly can affect both. That's exactly right. Yes, ma'am. How do you deal with the smoking in ulcerative colitis? <coughs> like if you tell the patient it's going to suppress their symptoms, I mean, it's going to exacerbate their symptoms if they stop smoking, they will not stop smoking. So. Yeah, so the, the question is, uh, you have an ulcerative colitis patient with, uh, with uh, smoking. I think that we have to uh, approach that independently of, um, of the uh, symptoms. Smoking for a young, especially young young person uh, who may be smoking the entire, uh, their entire lifetime is uh, obviously detrimental to the health. We have to just, you know, just approach each one of them and tell the patient that, um, you know, that it is detrimental. And sometimes I use this trick. I'll say, you know, continue smoking for a little bit. We'll start with the medicines, but then you absolutely have to stop the smoking. So you have to just have that finesse with a patient because again, you've probably seen and I've seen and the rest of the audience have seen, you do too much for any patient at any one time, they're out the door. Um, they're going to somebody else and uh, they're never coming back. But sometimes, sometimes you have people just say, Anything you want, doc, you know, just do it. Uh, tell me what to do and I'll do it. And then sometimes you have these people who just say, I'm not going to do this, but I'll do this. You know, it's like a uh, ordering from column A and column B in a restaurant. So you do the finesse and you work it out so that they, they do both things. That's the important thing. So Jeff uh, is a 37-year-old accountant with ulcerative colitis for 20 years. So this is what I promised this side of the room. Um, remember before we were talking about this, 37-year-old accountant with ulcerative colitis for 20 years. While biking, he injured his left shoulder. What would you like to offer Jeff for his pain relief? Remember what we talked about before? What are you going to do? Tylenol and some judicious use of pain medication. Which pain medicine? The one with acetaminophen, not the one with Advil. Perfect. Perfect. Um, and again, uh, that's, that's part of this process as well, is that you realize that um, that the NSAIDs uh, can exacerbate the situation, sometimes you're really stuck. And if you're ever stuck in the future, uh, back in your practice, you can speak to the gastroenterologist because they may just say, well, we can give low doses and we may be able to get by. Um, but again, if you can avoid it on these patients, so much the better. Bye. Ooh, so then let's wrap it up. It went by much faster than I thought, so let's get to the answer here that I wanted to say, my goodbyes. Ooh, 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 ooh. Japanese toilet, I want to thank you very much. That's where you'll find me.